Hello everybody, it's Paul Neeson with Torah Life Ministries and we are doing the Torah portion for next week, the Torah teaching, the foundation of all scripture. We're up to the 13th reading in this year's cycle and we're starting the book of Exodus. And the first reading in the book of Exodus is going to be from Exodus 1-1 to Exodus 6-1. So get your Bibles and open them up and we're going to read that because we, lo we last saw the children of, of Israel going down to Egypt and thriving in Egypt thanks to Joseph and everything that happened with that, and that's where we left off. Well, now we're going to go uh, to the first book of Exodus, which is a continuation from the last book of Genesis. However, there are about 400 years that passed since the last book of Genesis and the, next, uh, the first book of Exodus. So it is a continuation, but it's about 400 years difference. Now, if you're not familiar with the Torah, you don't know what it is, it's the foundation of all scripture. And you can't understand or really have something good on top of the foundation unless the foundation is strong. That's why it's so important people understand and read the Torah to understand what it is. And the Torah is the first five books of the scriptures. So we're up to the second book, which is Exodus. And it's the story really of the children making their exodus or their way out of Egypt into the so-called promised land that a wonderful creator promised them that they will have. Well, he actually promised it to Abraham when Abraham was a foreigner in the land of Canaan and he said this will be the land of you and your descendants and this is the so-called promised land but now we see the children in Egypt and at first everything was looking good in Egypt because Joseph brought them down there and or had them come down there and it was starvation all over the world but not in Egypt thanks to Joseph and his wisdom and and he was feeding his family and everything was great but we're going uh, 400 years later and we're going to see everything wasn't so great. So we're reading again Exodus 1 1 to 6 1. And we got to remember too the first word here it says, uh, These are the names of the son of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. Now it says, These are the men. Well, that kind of gives it uh, like it's a new, a, new, a new book or a new beginning. No, it's a continuation. And a more accurate word to start off this book of Exodus would be, and these are the names of the son of Israel, who the son of Israel, Israel was Jacob. So, and these are the sons of Jacob, or the sons of Israel, who came into Egypt with Jacob. Each man came with his household. And then we're going to look and it gets into naming the names. And it says all of the people that came into Egypt. Now, we just named all the names in the last book. And our creator named them by their name. He didn't just say these are the sons. He went and go ahead and named them. So, as he spoke about, he names the names in the first chapter, in the first verse here. These are the names, and then he gets into, and he gets on to Reuben and, and Simeon and Levi and so on. He goes through all the names. And then in the sixth verse, 1 6, it says, Joseph died as all his brothers in, uh, and all that generation. The descendants of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew very powerful, and the land became fulfilled with them. So it says that they were fruitful and the land multiplied. Now, we look, there were 70 of them that came into the land of Egypt, 70 of them. And it's estimated, I can't say exactly, no one can say exactly, but scholars will estimate that it, it was anywhere between 2 million and 5 million people that were now in the land of Egypt. And uh, some scholars more accurately would say about 2 million, 100,000, but some could say at least up to 5 million. Now, that was the quickest time in the history that the Jewish people grew. Here we look over a span of maybe 400 years where they went from 70 to 2 million or possibly even more. So we see here when it says they were fruitful, increased abundantly and multiplied. By the way, in the scriptures, one of the commands is to be fruitful and multiply. And that's what we have here. They were fruitful and they multiplied and they grew very powerful in the land because and the land became fulfilled with them. It says now, in, in, in verse number 8, 1 8, it says, Now a new king uh, arose over Egypt. He knew nothing about Joseph. So he knew nothing about Joseph. So this new king, now this is about 400 years after uh, Joseph. So this new king, so he knew nothing about Joseph. So the people of Egypt didn't do a very good job of keeping records of uh, the important things that happened in the land because Joseph was second in the land at that point. However, if I would ask people today who was the vice president 400 years ago, 
I mean, most people wouldn't, of the United States, most people wouldn't even know the president, forget along the vice president. So even though he was second in all the land, uh, maybe we could understand, even though we keep good records here in the United States, we still don't know who the, who the, the, the vice president was. However, this isn't the average person, this is the king. So if you ask the president today, uh, who was the vice president or the president 400 years ago, I think the president should know, uh, considering he's into politics and all that. Well, here we have a new king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph and said to his people, Look, the descendants of Israel have become a people too numerous and pow powerful for us. Come and let us use wisdom in dealing with them. Otherwise, they'll con uh, continue to multiply, and in the event of a war, they might ally themselves with our enemies and fight against us and leave the land altogether. Now, uh, from an Egyptian standpoint, there's uh, nothing up to this point that wasn't uh, a wise thing to consider. Uh, you know, we see how he treated them badly, which we'll be reading next. But at this point, he made uh, a decision that, hey, you know, here we are, the Egyptians, but the, we have these people growing so much today. And let's, you know, do something about this now before it gets out of hand in case of war. Now... I think they could have handled the situation better and, 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 and made friends with them or something instead of uh, oppressing them the way they did. That would have been wiser on their part. But lo and behold, he, he, he saw something had to be done or he thought something had to be done. And he tried to use wisdom and his wisdom uh, got him into more trouble than anything else because his wisdom wasn't the wisdom of our wonderful creator. And here's what he did, chapter 111. So they put slave masters over to oppress them, the people of Egypt, with forced labor, and they built for Pharaoh uh, store, uh, storage cities of Petam and Ramoth. Now, uh, if we look back in the history, these cities were actually already built. They didn't actually build them up from the ground. Uh, these cities were built, but it was a quite uh, common custom in those days for the new king to restore a city and enhance it and also name it, rename it. And that's what happened in these two cases. It says, but the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the children of Israel, the more they multiplied and expanded until the Egyptians came to dread the people of Israel. Now we look at this, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and expanded. We look at today's times and we look at all the, uh, the, the strife that's going on in the Middle East and amongst this little, little uh, country, Israel, they're, they're continuously being oppressed, war is being uh, made amongst them by all their enemies around them, but they continue to win and continue to thrive. So it's not too much different uh, back then or today than it was back then. Even amongst the oppression, they continue to thrive. And here it says, the more they multiplied and expanded until the Egyptians came to dread the people of Israel, and they worked them rentlessly making their lives bitter with hard labor, uh, digging clay, making bricks of all kinds of field work. And in all this to toil, they will show no mercy. So I think this doesn't give a justice of how bad they were actually treated. Let's give you a more updated example. And let's look at the Holocaust that we had in, 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 in the 40s and 50s in, in Germany, or in the 40s in Germany. Uh, we look at uh, the Holocaust and look at how the children of of Israel were oppressed and many other people were oppressed as well now when we think about that now maybe we can get a clearer understanding of how the people were oppressed back then in Egypt I mean they were put to slave labor and and they had to do it or else so this wasn't a little thing like oh they're just working a little harder than other people no this was a serious thing that I don't think people look at serious enough so uh, they were they were being oppressed by the children of Israel and that was the so-called wisdom of the new Pharaoh that knew nothing about Joseph of how he was going to keep them uh, under control, but that wasn't happening. But then it goes on to say in verse 15, Moreover, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, uh, one who was called Shirif and the other Puha. Uh, when you attend the Hebrew woman and see that they are giving birth, he said, If it's a boy, kill him, but if it's a girl, let her live. So again, I mean, this is oppression that they've never seen before, never experienced before, and I don't believe ever experienced since, even the Holocaust. I mean, let, you know, don't even let the children live. This is, is, is just absolutely uh, uh, the cruelest thing you could ever imagine. And then it says, uh, however, the midwives were God-fearing women 
So they didn't do as the king of Egypt ordered, but let the boys live. So uh, they, these were women that, you know, even in the impression, and again, I don't think we understand how these women or what these women did that was the, such an important step in, in Israel. And what it was, what they really did is they, they feared a wonderful creator and they didn't sort of come to the enemy. Just like Daniel, when he wouldn't uh, break Torah or he wouldn't eat the unclean food and he put his life in the line over and over again not to be uh, disobedient to our wonderful Creator's words. I mean, these midwives should definitely be up there with, with the most important people uh, ever to live. And when we look at what they did, they let the boys live. So now the king summoned the midwives and demanded them, why have you done this and let the boys live? So now, uh, you know, we see what they say. The midwives answered Pharaoh, it is because the Hebrew women aren't like the Egyptian women. They go into labor and give birth before the midwives arrive. Now, we don't know if they were telling the truth or not. Perhaps they were. Maybe they weren't to uh, save and protect themselves, which would ultimately would protect all the children. Now, if Pharaoh had any wisdom, he would have said the midwives not to attend their, their births at all or something. But I'm to believe that they... The, the, the Hebrew women, in fact, did, you know, give birth when the midwives arrived, not before. And the midwives still made sure that they had the sons and they didn't destroy them. So it goes on to say in verse 20, Therefore our Creator prospered the midwives, and the people continued to multiply and grow very powerful. So you see, out of their obedience they were blessed, and that's what happens. Blessings come along with obedience, and disobedience comes along with curses. And not only were they blessed, but the children continued to multiply and grow. Indeed, because the midwives feared our wonderful Creator, He made them founders of family. And that's the greatest blessing you could actually have. And then Pharaoh gave this order to all the people. Every boy that is born, throw into the river, but let all the girls live. So, now not as only telling the midwives, since the midwife says they're, they're given birth before we even get there. So now he's saying they must all be thrown into the river. I mean, this is something that's... Look, folks, I have kids, and I couldn't even imagine thinking of something like this. And, and this is what the children of Israel were under. I think we need to paint the picture more clearly. I don't think people take this serious enough when they read this. They don't realize what Moses actually did when he went to Pharaoh and who he was facing against. I mean, this was a cruel man. This was a man that, that was like, that was like somebody that was like somebody going to Hitler and saying, you know, let all the Jewish people leave Germany during the middle of the Holocaust. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, that's what was going on here. And, and now we're going to get to the, to the second chapter. And it says, a man from Levi took a woman, also a descendant of Levi, as his wife. So now during this time, we have a man from Levi who was finding his wife and, and they, they conceived. So they didn't, even, they didn't even say we're not going to have any kids because of the oppression that's going on. No. They, they, it says they, 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 she conceived and had a son. Upon seeing a, what a, a fine child he was, uh, she hid him for three months. Yeah. When she could no longer hide him, uh, she took a, a paperless basket, and there's many different translations and ideas of what this basket was actually made of, but uh, she took this basket, coated it with clay and tar, which they certainly had enough of, the children of Israel, because that's what they were, were dealing with at that time in their, in their oppression, and she put the child in it and placed it amongst the reeds in the riverbank. His sister took it to the distance to see what would happen to him or stood at a distance to see. Well, so she, she, she tried to hide uh, the, the child for as long as she could. And when she couldn't hide the child anymore, what she did was she, she put the child in the basket. So she, in fact, did put the kid in the river, but she didn't throw him in the river. She put him in this basket. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen. So now here it is, the basket's uh, floating down the river. And then it goes on to say, the daughter of Pharaoh who, by the way, didn't have any children at the time, came down to bathe in the river while her maids in attendance walked along the riverside. Now, first of all, I want people to understand this wasn't a public place. 
and this wasn't uh, the average part of the dirty river. This was a special part of a river, probably a private part in the river, that somehow was, was a clean part of the river. Um, and that's where she was. And maybe it was a hot springs in the middle of the river or something. But it wasn't the average dirty river in a public place where everyone could see her. I mean, this was the daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, nobody could possibly see her here. And even, even her, the attendants walked away and let her, her bathe alone. And so here she was alone. And, and this is what our wonderful creator did. He guided this basket right to her in this special private place in the river. So it says, uh, he guides this place uh, it, to her. So it goes on to say, spotting the basket amongst the reeds, she sent her slave girl to get it. So she calls a slave girl who's walking alongside the river and to go get it. So now, she opened it and looked inside, and there in front of her was a crying baby boy. And moved with pity, she said, this must be one of the Hebrew children. Now the sister of this little baby in the basket was following the river, or, or following the basket along the river, and went even into this private area, just following it, and was watching what happened. And at this point, after she saw, and, and maybe she didn't know who this was or not, this lady that picked up, the Pharaoh's daughter that picked up the basket and opened it up. But all of a sudden, she pops out and she says, uh, she says, uh, his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to go and find you one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? You see, at that point, now that might sound weird to us, but at that point, uh, wet nurses, or that's what it's called a wet nurse, when somebody else breastfeeds the baby other than the baby's mother, uh, that was, it's known as a wet nurse, and that was quite common at that time. So Pharaoh's daughter answered, yes, go. So the girl went and called for the baby's own mother. And Pharaoh's daughter told her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will pay you for doing it. Now this is amazing. Again, this is our creator's hand at work here. Restoring, restoring, and this is the real restoration of the house of Israel starting right here. Not only was the mother did she get a child back, but now she was paid to take care of her own child. So the woman took the child and nursed it. Now, she didn't just nurse it. She raised this child to understand the Hebrew lifestyle and so on. So she nursed it. And then when the child had grown some, so after the child had gotten the foundation of, uh, of being the Hebrew or living a Hebrew lifestyle, and after she was raised some, uh, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she began to raise him as her son. So now Pharaoh's daughter took over and she raised him and she called him Moses, which means pull out, because she pulled him out, explaining because I pulled him out of the water. So she called him Moses. And, and now here, she was raising him. So now this is very interesting because we just saw Joseph who was raised in the desert pretty much to be a king in a castle or in a palace. And now we're going to see Moses, somebody who was pretty much raised in a palace who was going to be a leader in the desert. So we see uh, the opposite. So we had uh, Joseph raised in a desert to be a leader in a, in a, in a castle or a palace. And now we're going to see Moses a leader or, or raised in a castle or a palace to be a leader in a desert. So that's what we're going to come to here. So one day, this was many years later, when Moses was a grown man, he, he went out to f visit his kinsmen. So not only was a, go a grown man, he was the first and only son uh, probably of this woman and the next to be in line as king, if possible, if it can be that a non-Egyptian can be king, but maybe he can... Uh, pull some trickery or something and, and, and this but this was the man in line Moses was the man in line to do it and but Moses was a grown man when he went out to visit the king's men and he watched them struggle at forced labor so he never forgot his mother his sister and, and his upbringing when he was young before he was given to Pharaoh's daughter to be raised and he saw what was happening and he watched and, and they struggled to forced labor and then he saw an Egyptian strike a Hebrew one of his own king's men now, uh, this is uh, a story that it could have been many different things why that man was being stricken. But one of the stories that was happening was that this uh, kingsman went into uh, the house of a Hebrew man and told the man to leave and, and, and then came in and told the wife to stay and was trying to have his way with the wife or so on. That's one of the stories. 
about this. Regardless, Moses looked uh, this way and that way, and when he saw that no one was around, he killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. So Moses here, you know, some people say he had a lack of faith because he looked both ways before he killed the man, but no, he was a very faithful man, and he said this has to stop this oppression. So he looked this way and that way, and he saw what was uh, no one was around him, and he killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrew men fighting with each other. Uh, to the one in the, in the wrong, he said, Why are you hitting your companion? And he restored, uh, re retorted, or he replied, uh, Who are you, uh, appointed ruler in the judge over us? Did you intend to kill me the way you killed the Egyptian? And now he knew he was known, and Moses became frightened. Clearly he thought that the matter was become known, and when Pharaoh heard of it, uh, he tried to have Moses put to death. But Moses fled from Pharaoh to live in the Midian, or the land of Midian, or he ran to the desert. It says, One day when he was sitting by a well, the seven daughters of the priests of Midian came to draw the water. So now Moses ran away from everything, all the riches of Egypt, and he was running for his life. And here he was in the desert with nothing. So now he's sitting in the desert. He's by a well. And then it says the daughters, uh, he was sitting by the well and seven daughters had came to fill, uh, to fill their water and so they could uh, feed their father's sheep or water their father's sheep. And when the shepherds came and tried to drive them away, Moses got up and defended them and they watched their, sh uh, and he watered their sheep. So not only did he defend them when the shepherds tried to tell the seven daughters that they couldn't go be there to water the sheep, Moses defended them and then he watered his sheep. And then when they came to Raul, their father, he said, How come you're back so soon? And they answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. More than that, he drew water for us and watered the sheep. Now, Moses was there, and this, should, this couldn't have been too much longer since Moses got out of the land because he still looked like an Egyptian in the desert. So he must have still had his clothing, and he must have still been shaving. So it probably wasn't too much longer. Uh, and, and, and this man, Raul, asks his daughters, you know, where is he? Why did you leave the man there? And why not you invite him to have something to eat? Now, we look at the name Raul, and we're going to see later he was called Jethro, and apparently this man has six or seven different names, but his real name was Raul, and Jethro was really a title, a priestly title. That's something that uh, people would say, well, you know, why, how did, why did, was he called Jethro? Because it was like saying, you know, the Holy One or, or the Anointed or something. That was his title. Now, he wasn't the Holy One or the Anointed One, but, but it was like His Excellency, to say His Excellency. So that's what Moses referred to him as, His Excellency. Moses always referred to him as his title, showing respect to the father of these girls, even from the beginning. But that's why you had a difference and his name was Raul and some people call him Jethro and so on. So Moses was glad to stay with the man. And now after some time it says he gave Moses his daughter uh, Tispala in marriage. So Moses was with the man and he was glad to stay there and eventually he gave Moses his daughter to in marriage. And she gave birth to a son and he named uh, him uh, Gershom, a foreigner there. For he said, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Once again, going off with the tradition of, of names meaning something and something important. So it says, Sometime during these many years, the king of Egypt died, but the people of Israel still groaned under the yoke of slavery, and they cried out, and they cried out for a rescue from slavery, and, and our Creator heard their cry, and He remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and He saw the people of Israel and acknowledged them. So now we get up to chapter 3 and about 40 more years or so would pass from chapter 2 to chapter 3. So we have Moses who was uh, maybe oh, 80 years old now or so. He was 40 years old when he left Egypt or so and he was in the desert and he got married out his son. So now he's maybe 80 years old or so. And in chapter 3 it says, Moses was attending the chief of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, leader of the flock to the far side of the desert. He came to the mountain of our Creator, and the angel of our Creator appeared to him in a fire blazing from the middle of the bush. Now, I am to believe that this is Yeshua, the Messiah himself, that Moses saw, and Yeshua reveals himself several times in the original covenant, and I believe here was one of them. Nobody has seen our Creator. 
but this is the son of our creator and, and or the form of the human form of our creator and it says the angel of our creator appeared to him in a fire blazing he looked and saw that although the bush was flaming with fire yet the bush was not being burned so Moses said I'm going to go over and see and this whole story is reaccounted in Acts in the seventh chapter of Acts when you look at the renewed covenant and it says this amazing sight and, and find out why the bush isn't being burned up. And when our Creator saw that he had gone over to see, he called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses answered, Here I am. And he said, Don't come any closer. Take your sandals off because you are walking on a holy ground. So this is what he's saying. And this is why there's a custom or tradition in some cultures around the world where when people go to worship, they take their shoes off. And uh, this was even a custom back then in uh, many, of the, many of the traditions and, and the places. So they took their shoes off. So Moses took his shoes off. He says, our Creator, I am the Creator of your Father. I am uh, the, the Most High, the Elohim. He continued, uh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And uh, Moses covered his face because he was afraid to look at him. And look at our Creator. And our Creator said, I have seen how my people are being oppressed in the land of Egypt and heard their cry for release uh, from their slave masters because I know their pain. I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the country to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the place of Canine, Hidai, Imarimari, uh, Prezai, Hevi, and Yuzvi. Yes, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen how terribly the Egyptians have pressed them. Therefore, now come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you can lead my people, the descendants of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, can you, re can you imagine hearing this? A creator telling... Now, it's one thing when our creator told Abraham to, uh, to leave his family and go into the desert and even send him into the land of Egypt. That's one thing. But to go here now and, and, this, and send him back, back to Egypt, back to Pharaoh. Now this was a new Pharaoh, but that was, they were pressing the children even more. I mean, let's paint a picture again in today's times. That's like sending, that's like him saying in the middle of the, of the war, go to Iraq or go to Afghanistan or something. I'm going to send you there to, to speak to the Taliban or something. And, and, and can you imagine that? To go, I'm going to send you there to speak to them. And, and, and this was a man that, that was, he had nothing. He was alone. He didn't have an army behind him. And he's going to send him that, there to speak to them? Well, we go on. Moses said, Who am I that I shall go to Pharaoh and lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And our Creator replied, I will surely be with you. Your sign that I have sent you will be that when you have led the people out of Egypt, you will worship our Creator on this mountain. And Moses said to him again, Look, when I appear before the people of Israel and say to them that a Creator of your descendants uh, has sent me to you, and they ask uh, me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? And our Creator said to Moses, Elah Esha Eliah, I am and will be what I am, and I will be, he added. And then our Creator said further to Moses, Say to these people of Israel, Yod Hei Bahe, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered generation after generation. Now, uh, this is a very controversial thing in the uh, in, in scripture, in, in all times today, is people saying uh, or what we call the name of our Creator. And I believe we should be using His name. And Yod Hey Va Hey is the, is, is the Creator. Some people might call say, Oh, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, and the Father. No, He is one. He is all one. Yod Hey Va Hey. And we don't know exactly the translation today. And there's many different sides or stories of what to call Him today. And, you know, some people say Yahweh, some people say Yahuwah, some people say Yahweh or Yahushua, but we do know one thing for sure. He said, I am be remembered by my name, not by a title. So I, I believe it's important that we, we attempt to call an a name. And here it's, uh, so I will say Yahweh or, or Yahuwah or, or Yehovah, but not 
God or Lord or something else. Now, if you're not convicted of that and you think that God and Lord is just fine to do, well, go and do that. But there are many gods and lords of this world, and I don't believe we should give our Heavenly Father an earthly title. Uh, but, but if some people don't see that, that's fine. Now, some people will say, well, you know, the name shouldn't be used, and even Jewish people today, at least uh, the Orthodox Jewish people today, will go so far to not even mention a name or want anyone else to mention and look at it as disrespect. Well, there's nowhere in Scripture that says it's disrespect. If you look back at the history and what has happened, when the children went into captivity, they didn't want the, the, their captives to take the name and use it disgracefully, so they stopped using the name. But when they got out of captivity, they didn't go back to using the name because they stuck to this thing that they were doing in captivity. But before that, they were using the name. And it says here, uh, our Creator went to go and continue to tell him, Go and gather the leaders of Israel together and say to them that uh, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me and said, I have been paying close attention to you, and I have seen what is being done to you in Egypt. And I have said that I will lead you, and have said that I will lead you up out of your misery of Egypt into the land of Canaan, Hidai, Amarai, Perizai, Hevi and Yusufai, uh, to a land flowing with milk and honey. They will heed to what you will say. And then you will come, you and the leaders of Israel, before the king of Egypt, and you will tell him that our wonderful creator, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now please let us go three days' journey into the desert so that we can sacrifice to our creator. Uh, and I know that the and then our creator went to go on and say to Moses I know that the king of Egypt will not let you leave unless he is forced to do so but I will reach out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders and I will do there uh, after he uh, after that he will let you go moreover I will make the Egyptians so well disposed towards these this people that when you go you won't go empty-handed Rather, all the women will ask their neighbors and their house guests for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, which you will dress your own sons and daughters. In this way, you will plunder the Egyptians. So this is what Moses was told. Now, Moses, this is the fourth chapter. Moses replies, but I am certain they won't believe me and they won't listen to what I say because they'll say that, you know, our creator did not appear to you. And, and our Creator answered Moses and said, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground, and it turned into a snake. And Moses recoiled, it from, recoiled from it. Then our Creator said to Moses, Put your hand out and take it by the tail. And he reached out with his hand and took hold of it, and it became a staff in his hand. Uh, so it, it, this is so that it will be b believed that our Creator the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, our Creator said to him, Now put your hand inside your coat. And Moses put his hand inside his coat. And when you took it out, the hand was leprous and white as snow. Then our Creator said, Now put your hand back in your coat. And he put his hand back in his coat. And he pulled the hand out again. And when he took it out, he was, this hand was fine and it looked just great just like the rest of his body. Uh, if they won't believe you or heed to the evidence of the first sign, they will be convinced by the second. But if they aren't persuaded even by both of these signs then st and still won't listen to what you say, then take some water from the river and pour it on the ground. The water you take from the river will turn out to be the blood on the dry land. Now remember here, this is Moses. I'm not saying this is what going to be the signs to Pharaoh, but this is going to be the signs to the children of Israel, so they believe you. This is going to be done in front of them. So Moses said to our wonderful Creator, O oh Yahweh, I am, I am a terrible speaker. I always have been. Basically, Moses was a stutterer. And I am no better now, even after you have spoken to your servant. My words come slowly and my tongue moves slowly. And our Creator answered him, Who gives a person a mouth? Who makes a person dumb or deaf? keen-sighted or blind. Isn't it I, Yahweh? Therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you say. Now this is a powerful statement here. A statement uh, some people have a tough time to hear and understand because we, it's hard to put this in perspective and to understand and have faith. 
Now, if you're a believer out there in the Most High, our wonderful Creator Yahweh, and your child is born blind or deaf, some people will go so far to even curse our Creator, but to un not understand. But here our Creator is saying, who does that? There's a reason for everything, folks. And I'm not saying that it's a, a reason that we can understand in our fleshly desires, but there's a reason for everything. I look at this lady, Joni Erickson Tata, who's a paraplegic, and she's using it to help many people around the world. You look at many other people that have so-called deficiencies or weaknesses, and they're used in special ways. And, and most of the people that our Creator used were no different than that in His scriptures. And there's a scripture, uh, a scripture in the Bible that says, uh, in our weakness we're made strong. And, and or, or you know it goes on the poor will be rich in spirit but the rich but the but the but the rich will be poor in spirit and, and and this is what we look at here so we don't know why certain things happen but we see here this powerful thing and and this has to be something as believers we need to hold on to especially during certain some tragedies in our life it says I'm going to read it again who gives a person a mouth who makes a person dumb or deaf keen-sighted or blind isn't it I Yahweh now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what to say now that doesn't mean that everything we say comes from him because we still have a choice in the scripture it says many are called but few are chosen no what it really says many are called but few choose so even though he gives us these things we still have the choice of what we say how we say and when we say it and Moses replied please please Yahweh send somebody else anyone you want at this our creator's anger blazed up against Moses and he said don't you have a brother Aaron the Levi I know that he's a good speaker in fact here he is now coming out to meet you and he'll be happy to see you so now here Aaron is coming to meet him out of Egypt so what made Aaron come out of Egypt well our creator controls our steps you will speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be your mouth and his teaching you both what to do thus he will be your spokesman of the people in effect for you thus he will be your spokesman to the people in effect for you he will be a mouth and for him you will be like a God now he wasn't saying like a God uh, you will be God because no man can be a God but he was saying, you will be holy to Aaron. And it says, now take this staff in your hand because you will need it to perform these signs. And Moses wouldn't really need it to perform those signs, but it was to comfort Moses knowing that he had something and he wasn't alone because uh, he felt alone and he had so much already a lack of doubt. So our creator comforted Moses by letting him use this staff and has this staff. So Moses left and returned to Jethro. His father-in-law said to him, now, this is, a, this is the first thing most do. I beg you to let me go and return to my kingdom in Egypt to see uh, that they are still alive. Now, again, Moses respected his father-in-law. He asked him, he asked him his permission several times, and here we see it again. I, I beg you to let me go. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. So, uh, our creator said to Moses in Midian, Go on back to your, uh, Egypt, because all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on a donkey and started out for Egypt. Now, he didn't spend much time with his wife and child, but he took them. And Moses took the staff in his hand that our Creator told him to take. And, and, and he said to Moses, When you get back to Egypt, make sure that you do before Pharaoh every one of the wonders that I have enabled you to do. So now he's telling him to not only do it to the children of Israel to prove that this is our creator that told me to do this, but he also told him to do it to the children of Israel. Nevertheless, I'm going to make him hard-hearted, the Pharaoh, and he will refuse to let you, you, my people go. Uh, it says here, he will refuse to let the people go, but let my people go or the children of Israel go. And then you are to tell Pharaoh that our creator says, Israel is my firstborn son. I have told you to let my son go in order to worship me, but you refuse to let him go. Well, then I will kill your firstborn sons. So at the lodging place on the way, our creators met Moses 
and would have killed him. And not, uh, he, not his wife, Tessapora, taking a, a, a flintstone and cut off the foreskin of her son. She threw it at his feet and said, What a bloody bridegroom you are for me. But then our creator said, Let Moses be. And she added, A bloody bridegroom because of the circumcision. So we see Moses did not circumcise his child on the eighth day like he was told to do. But he had to before he went to Egypt and do what he was called to do. So much so that our creator was going to kill Moses if this wasn't done. And somehow, some way, uh, the, the, Moses' wife did this. So, you know, there was a reason why Moses took his son and, and, and wife with him. And I believe this was the reason, to make sure this was done. And, you know, our spouses are used for a special reason. And our Creator knows everything that's going to happen. And saw that Moses didn't have any intention in circumcising his son. And how could he teach and tell the children of Israel in the desert later on what to do and how to be a leader? If he wasn't stepping up himself and keeping Torah and circumcising his son, not only on the eighth day, but just waiting and so on. And we saw, you know, the children of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we see when they circumcised much later after once they realized what they had to do. So this was an eye-opener for Moses, again, preparing him in the desert now to be the leader that he was going to be. So now it goes on and we look at Aaron and it says here in four, chapter 4, verse 27, that a creator said to Aaron, Go into the desert to meet Moses. So he went and he met uh, Moses at the mountain. Uh, and, and it says that uh, he kissed him. So he went and he kissed him. He was so happy to see him. And Moses told him everything that a creator uh, had said to him, including the signs that had, he had ordered him to perform. And then it says here, Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the leaders of the people of Israel. So now they went back into Egypt and they gathered all of those people. And Aaron said everything that our Creator had told Moses. And then they performed the signs for the people to see. And the people believed when they heard all that our Creator had remembered the people of Israel and seen how they were oppressed. They bowed their heads and they worshipped Him. So first thing we see, we didn't see Moses doing these signs for Aaron when he told him, but Aaron had faith. And he didn't say, well, let me see that to prove it. No, Aaron had faith. So Aaron and Moses went to Egypt. And, and he showed the children of Israel what had happened. And he said, the children believed them. And, 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 and that's it. The, the children worship. So now we have the children believing. Uh, Aaron and Moses are in charge. And, and they're, they're getting excited to go in front of Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh, you know, we have, to, we have to let us go because this is how it is and this is how it's supposed to be. So we're up to the chapter 5. And it says, after that, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, here is what our creator uh, the God of Israel says, let my people go. And so now let my people go, not let the people go or these people go. Let my people go so that they can celebrate a festival in the desert to honor me. But Pharaoh replied, who is Yahweh or who is a wonderful, who is the creator that I should obey when he says to let Israel go? I don't know him and I also won't let Israel go. And they said, uh, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert so that we can sacrifice to him. Otherwise, he may strike us with a plague or with the sword. The king of Egypt answered, Moses and Aaron, what do you mean by taking the people away from their work? Get back to your labor and look, Pharaoh added, the population of the land has grown, yet you were trying to have them stop working. So now we see here, the plan isn't going according to uh, the way Moses uh, and Aaron was going to hope it went. But this is what our Creator said. He won't do it. So it says, The same day Pharaoh ordered the slave masters of the people's foreman, you were no longer to provide straw for their bricks and the people for making uh, as you did before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But you will require them to produce the same quantity of bricks as before. Don't reduce it. Because they are lazing around. That is why they are crying, let us go to sacrifice to our God. Give these people harder work to do, and they will keep them too busy to pay attention to the speeches full of lies. So now we see what happens here, and we also have historical records or, or archaeological records. If you go back to the land of Israel and you go back to these so-called towns that the children were, were building or, or restoring, you look at the, the hay that was used for the bricks, 
wasn't uh, the hay that was always being used. It was uh, just weeds and anything they could find. Uh, it's just amazing how at the accuracy of the scriptures when you could dig up these cities and see exactly what was happening and so on. And it says, The people's slave masters went out, their foreman too, and said to uh, the people, Here is what Pharaoh says, I will no longer give you straw. Uh, go, uh, go, so go reduce. So the people were dispersed throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble and straw. The slave masters pressed them. Keep working. Make your daily quota just as, the, uh, just as when the straw was being provided. The foreman of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's slave masters has anointed over them, uh, were flogged and asked, Why haven't you fulfilled your quota of bricks yesterday and today as you did formerly? So now they're actually beating them up uh, and, and beating them and saying, How come you haven't done this? Then the foreman of people of Israel uh, came and complained to Pharaoh, Why are you treating your servants this way? The straw is giving, uh, you're giving to your servants, yet they keep telling us to make bricks. But how can we? Your servants are being flogged, but the fault lies with your own people. Lazy, he, uh, Pharaoh said. You're just lazy. That's why you say, let us go and sacrifice to our God. So, so you see here, Pharaoh was, was still very bitter that Moses and Aaron would even make this suggestion. He says, uh, get going now and get back to work. No straw will be given to you, and you will be, uh, still have to deliver the same full amount of bricks. And when they said you are not to reduce your daily uh, production of bricks, the foreman of the people of Israel could see that they were in deep trouble. It says, as they were leaving Pharaoh, they encountered Moses and Aaron standing by the road. So Moses and Aaron were standing by the road, not knowing what to do and just waiting. And then it says, uh, they said to him, May a wonderful creator look at you and judge you accordingly, because you have made us utterly abhorrent in the view of Pharaoh and his servants, and you have put a sword in your hands to kill us. And Moses returned to our creator and said, uh, Why have you treated the people so terribly? Why have the value, what has been the value of sending me? Things aren't better, they're worse. Why do you send me? Now they're even more upset at me. You know, for ever since I came to you, uh, to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has dealt terribly with the people, and you haven't rescued your people at all. Well, this is exactly what our Creator said what was going to happen. And then we're going to look at the first verse here of chapter 6, and then we're going to continue in the next, next, uh, next Torah portion next week. But it says here, and this is powerful. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Exodus. Our Creator said to Moses, now you will see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. With a mighty hand, he will send them off. With force, he will drive them from the land. So, our Creator is going to do something to Pharaoh so powerful that Pharaoh will send them away and, and, and he will drive them from the land. So he will, he will push them out of the land that he's going to want them to go so bad after what I do. Now you will see what I'm going to do. So our Creator has his own timing for things. And it's his timing we have to understand. So now you will see what I'm going to do. Now you will see. Not then, but now. Because now is the time. And that's what we got to think about. And it's going to continue in the next Torah portion. I'm going to tell you what it is right now. Read it. Study it prior to the Shabbat. Because that's when everyone else studies it. So you're prepared for it. And that's going to be the 14th reading, which will be... Exodus 16 2 to 9 35. So that's what we're going to read next time. But that's the Torah portion for this time. Listen, if you have any comments or questions, post them below the videos. And, and I want people to understand the foundation of all scripture. That's why I'm taking time so you understand and you read this and we can discuss the questions and so on. Don't just wait to the Sabbath to read it and definitely don't skip it. This is what the scriptures are all about. Remember, the foundation of everything and what Yeshua Messiah himself taught. Okay, so everybody, this is Paul Neeson, your health watchman, uh, saying uh, thanks for checking us out. Have a great week and Shalom Shalom. Thank you.